Uh, good afternoon, <coughs> um, uh, everyone, and welcome. I'm Fred Kemp. I'm president and CEO of the Atlantic Council. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for to our event on maximizing military power and minimizing uh, bureaucratic barriers. I hope you'll forgive me a personal comment before we get started. Uh, today uh, marked the passing of General Colin Powell, uh, one of America's great uh, soldiers and statesmen, uh, helped to guide the U.S. military to victory in the 1991 Persian Gulf War as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, he um, uh, is a holder of uh, the highest honor of the Atlantic Council, our Distinguished Leadership Award, which he received in 2005. And he's an honorary uh, director of the Atlantic Council and an advisor and a friend. Um, uh, born to in New York to Jamaican immigrants, he really was an American success story. Uh, first black chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, selected by President George W. Bush in late 2000 to be Secretary of State, uh, making him the first uh, black person to lead the State Department and making him soldier of statesman. Uh, when I asked him uh, during one of our uh, occasional conversations whether he preferred, I called him um, general or I call him secretary, uh, I refused to call him Colin. I told him that that would uh, harm the intimacy of our relationship. Uh, he said, I prefer you call me general rather than secretary. And I said, well, why is that? He says, because I earned that one. Uh, and uh, so I always loved that statement. And that is a good segue really to our event today. We're joined by two generals uh, with impressive and extensive backgrounds in US security and defense. General James L. Jones, uh, uh, also uh, executive chair emeritus, two times chairman of the board of the Atlantic Council, and Major General Arnold Panaro. And so thank you so much for joining us. And I'm sure you and everyone else join me in my salute to General Powell. Here at the Atlantic Council, we are committed to shaping the global future together with our allies and partners, with a dedicated focus on producing actionable recommendations with real world impact. Uh, the two individuals joining us today have done just that throughout their careers, significantly impacting US Department of Defense plans and priorities, though they probably, and they'll get into this in the conversation, they probably haven't impacted uh, the plans and priorities as much as they might have liked to have, and we'll get into that in the discussion. The Council Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security works to develop sustainable, nonpartisan strategies to address the most important security challenges facing the United States and its allies and partners. The center seeks to honor another general, General Brent Scowcroft, who passed away last year in August. Uh, and they, it, it seeks to honor his legacy, General Scowcroft's legacy of service that embodies his ethos of nonpartisan commitment to the cause of security, support for US leadership and cooperation with allies and partners and dedication to the mentorship of the next generation of leaders. Consistent with that mission, the Scowcroft Center's forward defense practice is designed to shape the debate around the greatest military challenges facing the United States and its allies. And it creates forward looking assessments of the trends, technologies and the concepts uh, that we believe will define the future of warfare. Looking forward, uh, U.S. competitors will only continue to develop more advanced technologies and employ innovative operational concepts that will alter the character of warfare. As China and Russia leverage speed from the acquisition of emerging capabilities all the way to their deployment, the United States maintains a pace of the past with organizational and cultural barriers standing in the way of a necessary innovation. However, uh, what worked yesterday will not be sufficient for the wars we fight today and tomorrow. As the global security landscape changes, uh, the US Department of Defense must adapt to a new set of priorities and constraints. And that brings us to today's event. General Panaro, who we'll hear from shortly, recently released a book titled uh, The Ever-Shrinking Fighting Force, which recognizes that despite record defense spending, uh, the U.S. Department of Defense is getting less return 
on investments than it did in the past. The Pentagon must transform processes bogged down by bureaucracy or trail behind, uh, especially as, or trail behind, especially as near peer competitors like China translate their economic successes into military power. And we just saw a, uh, uh, a test of a hypersonic uh, missile uh, from China yesterday that has uh, surprised a lot of people in the intelligence and defense community. Uh, this change is especially important as Pentagon decision makers map out the next national defense strategy and determine how to reform the department for greater performance and greater affordability. And as the U.S. seeks to maintain its competitive edge in the decades to come, our Ford Defenses team's project on seizing the advantage of the next national defense strategy continues to release key analyses that help chart the way forward for department efforts. And that's the context for today. I am delighted to uh, introduce our two distinguished speakers and our moderator. Our two distinguished speakers also happen to be part of our Atlantic Council family. Uh, General uh, James Jones is the executive chairman emeritus, as I said, and founder of the Jones Group International. He is known as a leading authority on energy security, foreign affairs, and national security. Under the Obama administration, he served as national security advisor to the president, overseeing the expansion of the National Security Council to include cybersecurity, homeland security, and strategic foresight. He's also served as commander of U.S. European Command the Supreme Allied Commander Europe, and is the 32nd Commandant of the U.S. Marine Corps, the most senior position in the Corps. Uh, no person ever has held all of the positions that I just named. Major General Panaro uh, serves on the Council's Scowcroft Center Advisory Board. He is also the Chief Executive Officer of the Panaro Group and Chair of the Board of the National Defense Industry uh, Industrial Association, the country's largest defense industrial association. He's a retired Marine Corps Major General, so these are not just two generals, but they're also two Marines. And Defense News previously named him one of the uh, 100 most influential individuals in U.S. defense. Uh, his new book, The Ever-Shrinking Fighting Force, serves as a catalyst for this conversation and offers uh, relevant insights into the future of defense. So, sirs, uh, generals, it's great to see you both and looking forward to hearing your perspectives. Moderating this conversation, is Missy Ryan, who serves as a staff writer and Pentagon correspondent with the Washington Post. Uh, for several years, Missy has reported on national security and diplomacy topics from over 10 countries spanning Latin America and the Middle East. Uh, it really is an impressive list of places uh, that she has visited in her career, including uh, and reported from Iraq, Egypt, Libya, Lebanon, Yemen, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Mexico, Peru, Argentina, and Chile, though nothing so perilous as Washington, D.C., Missy. Uh, so with that, let me pass to you. I'm going to encourage our audience on Zoom to direct any questions to panelists using the Q&A tab, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Identify yourself and your affiliation in your questions. We'll collect them throughout the event, and, uh, and Missy will post some to our guests toward the end. We also engage our online audience to join the conversation on Twitter by following uh, at AC Scowcroft and using the hashtag Ford Defense, hashtag Ford Defense. With that, Missy, let me pass to you. Thanks, Fred. I think we're going to be watching a, a trailer, then we'll get back to the oh, questions. Sorry about that. I'm General Arnold Panaro. I'm a retired Marine Corps Major General. I'm the author of a book entitled, The Ever-Shrinking Fighting Force. We face in this country the most existential threats we've seen in our lifetime, particularly from China. This book is written really for the citizens of the United States of America to understand that if we're gonna preserve our way of life and preserve our freedoms, we've got to have a strong military. We've got to get more bang for the buck for the dollars we're spending so that we can compete with the Chinese who now purchasing power is greater than the United States of America. Their military has grown very powerful. We are spending more than we've ever spent and yet the capability that we're getting for those dollars is decreasing. All right. 
Um, hi again, I'm Missy Ryan, and and uh, I think uh, if everyone can hear me now, I'm going to start the the event. Um, I'm really honored to be here today um, with um, General Jones and General Panaro. Um, it is um, a, a real privilege to be sitting um, with these uh, with these two professionals of such experience in national security and military affairs. Uh, and what we're going to do is have a moderated Q and A with the three of us for about uh, 40 minutes, 35 or 40 minutes, and then we're going to open it up to the audience for the last 15 minutes. So as you can see in the, the Q&A function on Zoom, you can submit your questions there um, as we're talking, and then we'll get to um, we'll get to them at the end of the conversation. Um, and so I just want to start uh, by talking about the book, The Ever Shrinking Fighting Force. Um, and um, General Panaro, you lay out a really um, striking case regarding some of the problems affecting uh, uh, the, uh, regarding the, the efficiency of military spending or the lack thereof. Um, and um, before we dive into some of the specifics, um, can you just tell us, uh, you talk about the fact that Americans are getting, aren't getting the same bang for their buck in their defense spending that they used to. Um, can you talk about why you think this is an important topic for Americans to be thinking about right now, given everything that's going out, uh, everything else that's going on in the world, COVID, um, you know, economic problems here at home, our political divisions and all of that. Why is this something that is an urgent topic at this moment? Well, thank you, Missy, and thank you for moderating the panel with your tremendous expertise. And as Fred Kemp said, thank Fred and the Atlantic Council. When things were breaking in Afghanistan, uh, Missy and her colleagues at the Washington Post uh, really had terrific uh, insights and information. Pleased to join my colleague of long, colleague General Jones. Uh, and I would say I want to associate myself with Fred Kemp's remark about Colin Powell. I know we all agree with that. I first met him as a young Brigadier General in the late 70s when I was on the staff of the Armed Services Committee, and I actually handled his confirmation to be chairman twice when I was staff director. One of the things I'd like to point out is he had immense respect for Congress's role in national security. And the book also focuses on Congress and the fact that Congress is not letting the Pentagon, in some cases, get the bang for the buck they would like to get. So it's not only an internal problem, Missy, in the Pentagon with their bureaucratic processes, is that the Congress basically is not willing to bite the bullet in some of these areas. But why is it important? And really, with every, like you mentioned, there's a lot going on in the world. We're actually, the world is more dangerous and unstable, in my judgment, than the peak of the Cold War. And our number one peer competitor, China, is on the march. It's on the march militarily. We could go into a lot of statistics there, but it's on the march economically. Although their economy is slowing a pad, it's still growing better, more than ours. They have more diplomatic posts around the world. You cover the State Department as well than we have in the United States. But what's really, really scary to me is they've got a huge technological leap on us in some key areas. And frankly, when you look at the role of our industry and you look at the role of our military and you look at how our military has been successful and when it hasn't been successful, look at what Colin Powell did at the beginning of Desert Storm and America's technology that basically won that war in the first three or four days. It's the technology that we give our war fighters so they're never in a fair fight. We don't want another country like China to have better technology than our military has. And we're not on the right path there right now. So that's why we're at an inflection point. We're out of Afghanistan. Uh, we're, we're moving our resources from the Middle East. We're at an inflection point. And, and even though we've got all these problems at home, if we want to basically keep our democratic freedoms and not have authoritarian states like China and Russia basically start to dominate even more uh, than they are, they are having successes right now, then we've got to make sure that we have a powerful deterrent with our military and we've got to be able to fight and win the nation's future wars. And that's going to take um, a lot of changes in the Pentagon. And it's going to take a strategy that's not an adding machine. An adding machine is not working. We're spending more in constant dollars in the peak of the Reagan buildup, and the force is 50% smaller uh, in all those statistics. So that's why it's important. Um, and we've got to work on the challenges here at home. But if we ignore what China's doing, if we ignore what Russia's doing, if we ignore what Iran and North Korea is going to do, is doing, we're not, we're going to wake up in five or six years. One last thing, and I know I've gone on too long with this answer. Mm -hmm. There was a book written about the Japanese surprise attack at Pearl Harbor. The title of the book was At Dawn We Slept. 
and it talked about all the warning signs that we should have seen. We don't need that book now. China is very outspoken. We know exactly what they're up to. They not only tell us, they do it. So we need to basically wake up and, and basically deal with this threat realistically and, 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 and get more bang for the buck for the dollars we're spending in the Department of Defense. Yeah, uh, General Panaro, you know, one of the, you lay out a number of, as I say, of a number of uh, striking or alarming facts um, in your work on this. And one of them that I found to be really compelling was the fact that um, you say that when combining the costs of active duty military, guard and reserve, retirees, civilians, and contractors, DOD spends over 70% of its base budget on personnel, spent over 70% of its base budget on personnel in FY16. And I think that really dovetails with um, a lot of the problems uh, that I hope we can get into a little bit later um, that DOD has had in quickly turning out new technologies um, and making sure that the development of new technologies don't take uh, uh, years and years and um, a huge amount of money. Um, and um, my question for you, General, Excuse me. Uh, having served in the leadership of the White House and, in, and of the Pentagon, why do you think this phenomenon isn't better understood? Uh, you know, there is strong bipartisan support for a, a big defense budget. Um, you know, I think that people talk about maybe trimming on the mar around the, uh, the margins. Um, but why do you think it isn't better understood that there are these huge efficiency problems, or at least that there need to be there needs to be uh, prompt action to address them? Well, thank you, Missy, and uh, let me uh, join in uh, our condolences to the uh, family of, uh, of General Powell, uh, who is really a statesman and a, and a soldier of, with very, very few uh, equals uh, in our history. Uh, we'll miss him greatly. Um, so I think, that, you know, one of the bigger problems that our country is facing today uh, is being asked in capitals all around the world, and, and that is whether the United States, let's, let's forget the Department of Defense for a minute, but whether the United States is in a period of decline. Uh, in our history, in world history, empires uh, have uh, risen and fallen uh, for, for two reasons. One, they rise because they have a, a, a good system, they have, their economy is balanced, uh, and and they they are able to um, uh, pay for what they for what they uh, want to achieve uh, economically, uh, but they fall for two reasons. One is uh, external conquest, and and the other is uh, internal collapse. And that's one of the things that people who are watching the United States closely uh, fear might be happening in in our own country. And so the fact that um, uh, General Panaro's book, The Ever Shrinking Fighting Force, is is out there is a reminder that uh, within the construct of our entire uh, fabric of our society, the Defense Department plays an important role. But in this day and age, it's not the only role. And so uh, one of the things that, that concerns me is uh, our inability to not, not, not only make our case uh, uh, to, uh, sounding the alarm, if you will, to, uh, to our public, and our uh, members of Congress and our leadership, but to actually formulate a strategic vision for where we want to be in the future. It is not a given that the United States is destined to be the world leader forever. Uh, that, that status comes about as a result of hard work, sacrifice, and a realization that we live in a very competitive world. So um, we have, um, we have been at work for some time, so I would say since Goldwater Nichols was passed, to sound the alarm that within the Department of Defense, uh, the amount of money that we're spending is not providing the, the, the basic needs of the nation in terms of uh, being able to meet the competition. Um, and I think we have to be very clear about what's needed, and what's needed is not only a reform in the Defense Department, but in several other agencies as well, um, including the State Department, for example. Um, so, uh, but until we realize uh, that, as General Panaro just pointed out, that the Chinese and the Russians 
are clearly engaged with us in, in asymmetric ways. Um, we might not have a, 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 uh, a kinetic uh, contest uh, with them, although it's, it's possible that we might, but we are in a contest in all other aspects of our culture and our society. And we are showing ourselves to be slow in making decisions and slow in, in understanding that the national debt is part of our, uh, our difficulties. The last budget that was, the last uh, balanced budget we had occurred during the Clinton administration. And ever since then, uh, we have been going in the, in, in the wrong direction um, in terms of what we, how we spend our, our dollars and, and what we get for it. So I think the book is, uh, is very timely and uh, a very useful reference to understanding the, um, the magnitude of the problem. In 1997, uh, as General Panara pointed out, we tried to, uh, uh, and we did write a, a plan for the Pentagon to reform its uh, entire uh, acquisition system and organization. Um, we, we have had no secretary really that has been able to take this on as the, uh, as the primary, as one of the primary missions, uh, because there's some, maybe because there's so much else going on that captures their attention, but the problem has only gotten worse and, uh, it's very incumbent upon, uh, our public and our think tanks and, and members of Congress to understand exactly what the direction is so they can start applying some of the remedies that we need. General Jonesy, I want to build on on um, one, uh, a few things that you said and, and, and uh, put this question to both of you. You know, uh, we talk about the need for more efficient, uh, efficient defense spending. Um, and it strikes me that, you know, while, uh, you know, there has been an ongoing conversation for many, many years, and we were just talking in the green room bef before the event about, you know, um, decades long efforts to, uh, you know, um, really make reforms in, in defense acquisition and the way that our defense dollars are managed. Um, even though, you know, you go to the Hask hearings, the SASC hearings, you hear members of Congress talk about this, you hear um, Pentagon leaders talk about the, the need to increase efficiencies and all of that. It really hasn't happened in the way that anybody would have liked. And I'm wondering, um, what, if you all, either of you think that, is there a way to force greater efficiency or bring about greater efficiency in the way that we curate and spend these dollars while continuing to give the Pentagon, you know, a pretty big budget, um, certainly larger than any other country in the world. Um, there seems to me um, potentially that there's a lack of incentive there. And, you know, while we could argue about whether it should be, you know, 700 or 730 or 750 um, billion dollars, uh, it's still a lot of money. And so I'm wondering how you square that circle between, you know, the, the carrot um, for the Defense Department and the potential stick of a lower budget. I'm gonna let Arnold uh, answer that uh, first and then I'll come in with a comment. Okay. So Missy, you hit the, as we say in the Marine Corps, you just put steel on target, you hit the <laughs> thing right in the bullseye. And I would say former Senator Russell Long, who was chair of the finance committee, which my boss, Senator Dunn and Jim and I were working in this, or General Jones and I are working in the Senate together. He had a thing say, don't solve a problem for people before they know they have one. And one of the problems we have right now is people do not in Congress and in the Pentagon and the American public, and even the media don't realize the huge ticking time bombs that are getting ready to explode in the Pentagon. And we need to educate and inform people. That's really what my book is all about. And let me just give you a couple of examples. And I think if we were able to get this point through, let's take the one you mentioned about what I call the fully burdened and life cycle cost of the volunteer force and personnel. If you add in the 1.3 million active duty, the 880,000 drilling members of the Guard Reserve, the 750,000 defense civilians, the 750,000 defense contractors, not the ones building the weapons, but the ones that work every day supporting functions in the Pentagon. And then you look at the fact that we have 2.4 million military retirees. We have 1 million more retirees than we have serving on active duty. You look at the healthcare budget, which is gone from 17 billion to $52 billion a year. It has 10 million beneficiaries 
of which 5.6 million are retirees and their dependents. So over 60% of the DOD's healthcare budget is supporting people that are no longer serving. And the life cycle costs, we now pay people for 60 years to serve for 20 years. I'm not making a criticism. I'm not just saying that's the realistic. We have a trillion dollar unfunded liability in the military retirement system. You were spending $400 billion a year in the acquisition on goods and services, supplies and equipment. And about the only charitable thing you can say is spend more, take longer, get less. China builds 30 naval combatants when we build five. China basically, we used to be able to build fighter aircraft in, in from contract to first article in about five years. It now takes 30 years. China's now doing it in five years. We had we had 14 companies that could build fighter aircraft in when Ronald Reagan was president. Now we barely have two. So we've got the in the DOD's overhead. When you look at the amount of money that goes to defense squad spending, it's gone from seven percent to the budget. They say 20 percent. But if you add in the, the part that's buried in the Air Force budget, it's more like 30 percent. It's grown more rapidly than the actual budgets of the military departments where all the war fighters are. So we have this massive overhead. We have these huge costs uh, for the major weapons. Norm Augustine was correct. When he wrote Augustine's Laws 20 years ago, he said, look, the cost of these weapons are gonna be such that we can only afford you know, one of each. And that's kind of where we are now when you look at some of the costs of these major weapon systems. Same thing with sustainability. Chuck Spinney got on the front page of the New York, of the, of the Time Magazine complaining about the uh, runaway cost of these major weapons. And now we're paying the price. So all of these problems, people need to understand them. Congress needs to understand them. And people are gonna have to bite the bullet because these trends are so adverse. If we don't have a lot of time to turn them around, but I think it's really educating and informing. And frankly, the people that come to work in the Pentagon every day, the civilians, the military, the guard and reserve and contractors, they come to work every day trying to do the best job they can for our taxpayers and the war fighters. But as former Secretary of Defense Bill Perry once said, bad processes beat good people every day. And we have this proliferation of bad bureaucratic processes in the Pentagon. And the same thing in the Congress. Norm Augustine calls the Congress now the broken branch. They don't get their work done on time. They don't do detailed oversight anymore. They we're in CRs for the last 25 years. So we have got to fundamentally change the processes in government in both the Congress and the Pentagon if we're going to remain uh, competitive with China and Russia. That's the problem. Missy, another way to another way to add on to that, which was very helpful, uh, Arnold. Thank you. Um, is to say that um, I've been around long enough, and, and I think General Panaro has as well, to have gone through the Goldwater Nichols uh, days of legislation. So another way of saying that is I've been in the in the conscripted force and I've been in the all volunteer force, and the all volunteer force uh, was was a great creation, but I I think I think it's time for um, I think it's time for us to um, think about a, a new a, a new uh, Goldwater Nichols to correct the unintended consequences that General Panaro has just uh, identified. We uh, we are on a ticking time bomb. Um, we have we've seen uh, nuclear modernization costs, which are going to double to about seven and eight percent of the budget in the next few years. Um, our conventional forces will will by force contract on the current course, and um, you know whether you go from the Reagan the Reagan Cold War force to the Obama Global War on Terrorism. Today, we're spending more uh, than the Reagan buildup at its peak uh, for a much smaller military. Now, I do believe that, that the contest with our primary uh, competitors uh, is multi, much more multifaceted. It, it's, not, it's not only uh, you know, who's going to win a kinetic fight. Uh, there may be smaller skirmishes. There may be tests here and there in the South China Sea and the like. But the real, um, the, the real fight here is, I, I think, primarily with China and, and primarily expands much more than just the, uh, much more than just the Pentagon. Uh, we have to be able to make decisions more quickly. We have to be able to understand holistically uh, the threats it faces. And we have to understand that, that um, this, is a, this is a real contest. Um, 
against an enemy that is well organized, uh, a potential enemy that is well organized, uh, well funded. Um, they have the advantage, I, I guess they have the advantage if, it, if they're correct, of strategic, uh, strategic planning and strategic thinking that, that, that crosses over decades, whereas potentially we can change governments every four years. Uh, so that's um, those are realities that we have to deal with, and um, and I think the Pentagon is a great place to start, as uh, General Panaro pointed out. Um, the tooth to tail ratio the, um, is out of whack in most of the services. Our national debt and deficit uh, um, don't contain any offsets. We've added twenty two trillion dollars between uh, 2020 and 2025 to our national debt. So, you know, until people start talking about that and really understanding what it means in the future, we are liable to be on a slippery slope uh, towards decline rather than the, the opposite, which is what I think most American wants. Hey, hey, Thank Nancy, you, Jimmy. Yeah, make please. a quick point uh, on General Jones, because I want to underscore one thing, because a lot of times I hear from people that say, well, Arnold, you all are the Pentagon. You're always exaggerating the threat. Cap Weinberger said the Soviets were 12 foot tall. They really weren't. The Chinese really aren't that good. But let me say, General Jones and I served as infantry platoon commanders in Vietnam. And I was there in, in my area. I was in the Khoisan Mountains and my little Marine rifle platoon. Our mission was to interdict the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And that was in the, the mountains. And that was way where the Chinese brought supplies into the Viet Cong and into South Vietnam. And our mission was to keep them from doing that. So we we actually, I've actually had personal experience with fighting against Chinese military. These were tough fighters. These are not people that are pushovers. So the notion that some people have, they say, well, they've never been in a real fight. Talk to the Marines that fought the Chinese at the, at the Frozen Chosen. Uh, we should not underestimate. And the problem I have is they're just got the march on technology that's always been our military's tremendous advantage. They have gone ahead of us in some areas, they are catching up in other areas. And these technologies missing are not just important to the Pentagon, they're fundamental to our economy being competitive in the world in the future for a strong economy. And you can name them. So, so we really need to wake up and take these challenges very, very seriously. Yeah, no, I, I think that's uh, absolutely right. And just to add to one of the advantages that you all um, were citing that China has, uh, another one is that it has used espionage to um, acquire many of the technologies that the United States developed um, at great cost. Um, I actually, I'm going to circle back to you, General Jones, with another China question. But before I do, General Panaro, another another related question, um, uh, going back to it, a comment you made earlier about Congress. So I'd love to hear from you, um, having um, you know served in the military and extensively on Capitol Hill. It seems like a lot of the the reforms that both of you are talking about are going to require significant congressional action. Um, how do we do that? How do we make that happen? Given you know the um, the dysfunction of Congress and um, the advantages that are divvied up in the different districts and that have made it um, contributed to the difficulty of uh, making reforms. Well, let me say again, I was privileged to serve in the Senate with Senator Nunn and others for 24 years, staff director of the Armed Services Committee for 14 years. The, the, the defense committees, the House and Senate Armed Services Committee, the House and Senate Defense Appropriation Committees are still a bipartisan oasis of wanting to do the right thing for the country. Those committees work, they work together, they work on a bipartisan basis, they pass their legislation. Now the appropriation bills, because of the larger uh, congressional dysfunction, they don't get them out on time, but it's not within their control. And individually, if you look at the leadership of these committees, uh, they, they, they wanna do the right thing and they wanna do these reforms. And so I think we've got an opportunity at this inflection point. You've got a lot of new people on both the Senate and the House Armed Services Committee on both sides of the aisle that served in the in the modern wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, pushing up through the system. General Jones is correct. We really need a Goldwater Nichols for the management chain of command in the Pentagon. We fixed the operational chain of command in '86 and Goldwater Nichols. But I think I think if we basically could get the committees to uh, to agree with the description of the problem and to agree with the pressing nature 
And to get the Pentagon, you the problem you have is the Pentagon is not very cooperative on some of these things because these are a lot of rice bowls um, that that you know, and a lot of, of of jobs that are tied into them in the Pentagon. So you've got to get the Pentagon. If like uh, we talked in the green room, Don Rumsfeld was willing, as will Bill Cohen, to take this on. And so the Pentagon, if they basically signal to the Congress, which I think is already inclined in that direction on the bipartisan defense committees, they want to get more bang for the buck, uh, then you could work those things in a cooperative way. But I'll tell you, it took us three, four years to pass Goldwater Nichols over the objection of everybody in the Pentagon. Um, and that was because you had some really, really strong leaders uh, in Barry Goldwater, Sam Nunn, Bill Nichols, Les Aspen, Bill Cohen, people like that. Um, and you've got to have the cooperation of the Pentagon on these processes. They're exceedingly complex. These defense agencies do more business with the Department of Defense than our for-profit companies. That's how massive and how large these organizations are. So I think the will is there. It's just going to take the Pentagon and the Congress, and it's going to take us from the outside, and it's going to take the news media focusing people on the nature of the problem and getting people to be willing to show a little profile and courage and backbone and bite these bullets. My, my, Missy, may I add yeah. just Please. a little? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so I think one of the things that um, we should be careful about is, is not to overstate um, you know, China's capabilities and Russia's capabilities. Russia has a GDP the size of New York State. Uh, Vladimir Putin is more of a nuisance than he is a threat. They have nuclear weapons, so that makes him a bigger threat. But it, it boggles my mind as to why we accord him or why the world accords him the respect of, uh, that usually is reserved for statesmen when he really is just a, a, a two-bit dictator who's, uh, whose goal is to mess up everything we do um, as much as possible and in Europe. And you're going to see this. Um, this winter with regard to his use of energy uh, in Europe as well when it gets cold. The other thing in China, I, I wouldn't, I, I think we have to be careful not to overstate uh, what, what, what China is. China has a lot of internal threats that are going to come to come to roost here. Uh, their one, one child policy established years ago is making China the oldest uh, country in the world. And, um, and that's going to impact their workforce and a lot of other things. So there's a lot of things that that um, that that will preclude China from achieving uh, achieving their goals. But one that I want to uh, emphasize, and this is one where the Pentagon can play a big role, is is in the cybersecurity arena. Um, recently, uh, in the Washington Post and other papers, they highlighted the resignation of a of a defense official who uh, said that the war with the war on cybersecurity with China is already lost. And uh, I, I, I spend a fair amount of my time on cybersecurity issues. And I can, I can tell you with certainty that it is not lost. I know a lot about the technologies that we're working on. And uh, I believe that if we uh, apply ourselves and organize ourselves in uh, a better way in which to take on this fight, that the United States can be the global leader in, on cybersecurity issues and render ourselves relatively impenetrable uh, and completely secure in a relatively short period of time and also provide that kind of capability to our friends and allies like the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So this is a near-term fight. This is the, the wolf closest to the door. Um, the Defense Department can play a huge role uh, in harnessing these technologies that we know are out there. But until we organize ourselves, for example, I'll use the term of a Manhattan-like project like we did in, in the 20th century, but a Manhattan-like project for cybersecurity and harness the technologies that are out there in a way that um, catapults the United States into a position of unquestioned leadership on cybersecurity issues. Uh, we're and uh, we're we're going to be chasing uh, China rather than leading. And I and since we have the the capacity to lead, I, I think most Americans would rather have that situation. Well, uh, thanks, General Jones. So you actually 
Uh, I answered one of the questions I was going to ask you about China, about the potential for overhyping the problem. So I'm going to build on um, what you were talking about at the end of um, your most recent comment about cybersecurity. And um, I'm curious, I'm, I'm interested uh, that you think that it's something that we can um, uh, overcome. And the idea of a cyber martial project, is, is a Manhattan project, excuse me, is interesting. Um, but what makes you think that... Um, the, the United States can overcome the problems that it's had to date. You know, we've seen problems of vulnerabilities with U.S. government networks. And I'd also like you to address, if possible, the cyber vulnerabilities in the defense industry and the defense supply chain, which seems to be um, as big a problem um, because of the technology that they um, have on those systems and, and, you know, the fact that they've been a major target in the past. Well, for... Uh, more years than I care to uh, admit, um, we have been vulnerable to penetrations by uh, our competitors, uh, China in particular. It's, it's no accident that the latest Chinese fighter looks an awful lot like the F-35. Um, and it's no accident that China has made tremendous strides. But China, to me, is not a country that innovates. It's a country that captures the, uh, the, the capabilities and the technology that countries like ours develop. And so it, it is incumbent upon us to organize ourselves, in my view, both in the public and private sector, to prevent these kinds of things from happening. And, and in my work in the cybersecurity world, I know that there is technology out there that properly harnessed and, and, and brought together in a way that fuses the interagency together so that you don't have the Defense Department working on one thing and the State Department working on another and uh, other agencies kind of doing their own thing. We have got to stop the penetration and the pilfering of our, of our technologies. We've got to make companies like Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman and our big defense companies um, more, um, uh, more secure. And, and those technologies, uh, I believe, are out there. I know they're out there. But we have not, in any administration, in, in this administration or the last administration, come together to form a, a central Manhattan-like project, if you will, that brings the best of the private sector and the public sector together to protect ourselves. Um, and until we do that and organize ourselves, we're going to be we're going to be chasing um, uh, the, the, the we're going to be chasing in the contest here. We want to lead in the contest, and we want to once we get our house in order, we want to make sure that our friends and allies have that same capability as well. Thanks. I think we um, have time for one more question before we open it up to Q and A. And uh, General Panaro, I just wanted to ask you. You know, we we you lay out in the book. Um, and we've talked here today about a lot of the challenges that the Pentagon and the overall um, a system around um, defense spending and um, uh, technology development and procurement have. What would you want um, people to know about what is going right, what the Pentagon is, is doing right, um, maybe that people don't know about? I would say and reiterate the point that uh, as someone that, along with General Jones and others, has been privileged to be in uniform for 35 to 40 years, to work in government, to work in our defense industry, to serve side by side. The people in the Pentagon, again, that come to work every day, the career civil servant, the active duty military, guard and reserve, the contractors, the think tanks, the federally funded, they are trying to do the very best job they can for our taxpayers and our war fighters, and their lot is going good. If you look at acquisition, you know, and I've complained about that, and frankly, one of the Challenges right now is we don't have an undersecretary for acquisition, we don't have a deputy, and we don't have four of the assistant secretaries in that job in that area where we're spending $400 billion a year and we're nine months into the administration. That said, under Frank Kendall, Ash Carter, and Ellen Lord in the last administration, they've made a lot of good progress in terms of improving acquisition. But it's not how far we've come, it's how far we still have to go. Uh, if you look at, for example, Heidi Shu, who's the new undersecretary for research and engineering, she's a barn burner. I'm telling you, she's going to basically uh, move out smartly in a lot of these high technology areas. 
uh, cyber. There's a lot going on there. We're not organized for combat like General Jones has suggested we need to be. Too much of it is just putting out press releases saying how much money we're spending. And the question is, are we really kind of getting still on target there? But, but again, in our military, if you look at our military, what they do each and every day. Today, we have over 30,000 members of the Guard and Reserve on active duty, working, helping in COVID, helping in hurricanes and fires. From 9-11 to now, over 1 million members of the Guard and Reserve have been mobilized to serve overseas and here at home. And they're a bargain for the taxpayer. We didn't have to build any schools or hospitals or tactical equipment shops or family housing because they're part-time, but they serve on active duty when they're needed. So there is absolutely a lot good and again, and, and you know, I think we do have the finest military in the world for three reasons. One, we recruit and retain the very best people. That's gonna be even more challenging. The cohort of 17 to 24 year olds that we've targeted, a lot of them are not medically qualified anymore. We also have realistic and constant training. That's always a challenge. But the big thing is we, we, we give them the very best technology and that comes from industry. Government does not innovate anymore, as General Jones has indicated. Innovation comes from the private sector. We've got to get more of our industry uh, and non-traditional suppliers, and this Pentagon and the Pentagon before it uh, has tried to do that. And I would say in terms of cyber, um, you know, speaking in my hat for the National Defense Industrial Association, our 1,600 members, including the large primes that General Jones mentioned, we're fanatics about meeting the government's requirements meeting the CMMC. We all agree a thousand percent that we've got to protect our networks. We've got to protect the technology. We've got to protect classified information. And the department needs to basically in the regulatory framework, provide things that will actually work rather than just kind of disseminating what I call Moses and the 10 commandments. And, and we're working with them on that. So there's progress being made there and well, but you're exactly correct. We You can't do enough. I've talked to most every head of the, of the cyber commands going all the way back to Keith Alexander. And they basically say the offense can always overwhelm the defense. So you can, we can never rest on our laurels, Missy, when it comes to protecting our networks and to our industry protecting the technology that's gonna be so essential uh, for deterrence. And if we have to, you know, go to war in the future. Uh, General Pinar, let me just very quickly follow up before we do move to questions on something you just said. You know, people will debate a lot about um, you know, consolidation in the defense industry and the dominance of, you know, a smaller number of large companies. Is the need for, um, you know, greater, uh, more effective cybersecurity an argument for, you know, a consolidated defense industry where there is a small number of larger players versus, you know, a larger ecosystem of small companies, given the resources that are required in order to um, defend technology from attack? Missy, I, I, I'm one that believes that there's a lot of innovation in our small businesses and our large businesses team with the small businesses. They don't need to buy them up and consolidate. We don't have enough competitive pressure in the Department of Defense right now on our major weapons. So uh, more consolidation in my judgment, particularly if we're gonna consolidate uh, and it basically reduces innovation, that would not be a good thing. And so uh, what I think though is is our primes, if, uh, you know, some of the CEOs have had recent uh, things in the think tanks and have spoken, you know, really about how to change uh, the format going forward and that everybody is very forward leaning. We've got to innovate. We need, we need to innovate, not just in the defense industrial base, we need these innovations of 5G, of microelectronics, of quantum, of, of biotechnology. Uh, we need to basically secure our supply chain where 40% of our pharmaceuticals don't come from China, where they, China doesn't have all the rare earth minerals that we need in our high technology. So there's a lot that has to happen here, but greater consolidation and things that would reduce competitive pressure in the department or reduce the innovation in our small businesses would not be a good outcome. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to read out some of the questions from the audience and um, I'm going to take the liberty of combining two related questions for our first question, given that we only have 11 minutes left. Um, uh, the, this is from Miles Mukasey of Brown University and uh, Scott Porter of Thales US. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Um, so he, uh, Miles asks, do you two believe that a Chinese-Taiwanese war is imminent? Is the United States prepared in terms of planning and technology for that situation? 
Um, and then the second part would be, you know, do you, do you have suggestions for how to communicate the urgency of this issue, meaning the problems that you're describing in your book, General Panaro, to parts of Congress not involved in defense before there is a wake up call situation, such as a potential invasion of Taiwan? So it's sort of a, a current events question combined with um, a question more central to, to the book. Our combatant commander should go first on that, General Jones. <laughs> So, uh, you know, that's a hard one that uh, the, the Taiwan issue is, is hard to answer. Um, but I would say that uh, what's going on right now in the, in the, uh, on, the, on the global playing field with our principal competitors is, um, is, a, is a testing game. Uh, they're trying to size up uh, the will of our leadership. Uh, they're trying to figure out what we would, what, where our vulnerabilities and weaknesses are, whether we have the, the, the resolve to stand behind uh, our values and uh, what, what we've stood for for a, a long time. Um, and I think that, um, you know, as I said earlier, there is an open question about whether the, the U.S. is in decline as they would like us to be. Uh, I don't believe that has to be the case. I do think there's some things that we have to fix and quite a few things. Uh, it would be great if uh, members of Congress would unite on the subject of national security from both parties, uh, so that if one party says one thing, the other party doesn't say another just because they're uh, not Republicans or Democrats. So I, I, I think that um, back in the in the 20th century, uh, just before before the end of the Cold War, um, the the congressional uh, national security caucuses were, were really bipartisan. Uh, and we need to return to that era of bipartisan concern for the good of the nation and the leadership that we want to provide um, for, the, for the rest of the world. So I, I don't think, um, my personal view is that uh, I don't think there's an invasion of Taiwan that's imminent, but I do think there's a lot of testing going on and data accumulation based on uh, what the Chinese are doing in the airspaces and so on and so forth. And I think we have to be, be clear and unambiguous that when we say something, we mean it, and we have the capabilities to, um, to, make, it, uh, you know, to make it happen or to enforce it if we have to. Missy, I, I support what General Jones said there. Basically, we need to send a signal to that part of the world and particularly to the Chinese that we, we honor our commitment to Taiwan under the Taiwan Relations Act. I was in the Senate when that passed. Actually, President Jimmy Carter asked my boss, Senator Nunn, to fly to China and meet with Deng Xiaoping. And we also went to Taiwan and met with the, the head of there, John Glenn, who fought with Chiang Kai-shek, you know, during the war was with us. The Taiwan Relations Act, basically, we, we should honor our commitments. It's really important for people to see that when we have a treaty or we say we're gonna basically defend this Korean peninsula from North Korea if we have to do, or we're gonna help Japan, which is now talking about increasing its defense budget beyond its traditional 1%, that we're gonna make good on our commitments in that region. And Taiwan, it's essential that people in that part of the world, particularly the Chinese understand, uh, we mean it when we say it. And that's one of the worries that a lot of us have uh, coming out of Afghanistan when we left a lot of the people that supported us behind, you know, Jim, General Jones and I grew up in the military. You never leave in your wounded on the battlefield. And, and our credibility has been strained. We need to basically reassure uh, that part of the world and reassure the Taiwanese that we're gonna be there if they need us. And the Chinese need to understand that. I mean, I guess just to build on that really quickly, how do you get, get going back to Scott's question, how do you get greater buy-in from, um, you know, the, the scope of uh, Congress that isn't on the Hask and the Sask to have greater focus on China or to make these efficiencies when, you know, there is a lot of pushback um, in some of these recent decisions that I think really for the first time in my analysis are, sh are showing that the rubber is starting to meet the, the road in terms of a U.S. shift towards China, you know, especially, you know, for example, the um, withdrawal from Afghanistan or this recent submarine deal with Australia, you know, these are disruptive decisions, um, but they could be part of this larger shift. And there is, you know, a lot of criticism from both parties um, to some to elements of those decisions. So I'm wondering, how do you how do you do that? Well, I, I think, Missy, the good news is right now when it comes to China, 
there's strong bipartisan support both in the House and the Senate uh, that we need to basically deal with the issues associated with China. You've got a lot of legislation that's been in the works. You've got in the, the, the military bills, the Pacific Defense Initiative, uh, they're building on that. Uh, the Pentagon gets it. Uh, and so I, I actually think that's one of the real pluses in our Congress right now is people are not fighting the problem in terms of, of understanding the nature of what we've got to deal with when it comes to China. Now, when you get into the specifics, because of course there's a lot of business. I mean, our farmers sell a lot of goods to China. Our defense and aerospace companies, you know, have, have businesses over there. So there, when you get into the eaches, that's when it gets a little tough. But on the other hand, um, you know, I think there is a genuine awareness uh, that this is something that we've got to pay a lot of attention to and it's on a bipartisan basis. So I'm encouraged there. What we've got to have is an administration at a Pentagon, and I'm not specifically pointing the finger at this one, that comes to Congress with specifics. As General Jones said, here's some things that we need to do. Here's some things the administration supports. Here's legislation that we need in this area. Again, uh, it's, and it's not just the Pentagon. We're too dependent on the Chinese supply chain for a lot of the issues. It was very troubling to somebody like me when COVID hit and when the head of the New England Patriots decided he wanted to basically help out and get masks, N95 masks and ventilators, he didn't fly his airplane to Peoria, Illinois to get it. He flew it to China because that's where the supply was. We just can't have that. We've got to basically shore up our supply chain in a lot of areas. And again, I think Congress would be very receptive, but in being candid, executive branch has to lead in this area. They have to come up with specific proposals and then Congress needs to deal with them. All right, I think we have we have three minutes. I think we have time for one last question and I'm gonna um, kick it to you, uh, General Jones. And there is an interesting question from Colonel Tim uh, Kuhn, I may be pronouncing that wrong, um, from the US Air Force. Um, could you further describe what a Goldwater Nichols 2.0 would entail, particularly as we're organized primarily in a regional in regional combatant commands and um, see a rise of functional combatant commands with the SecDef being the only global integrator? It's a very nuts and bolts question, but I think it's a really interesting one. Yeah, and, and, and uh, you can't do it in two minutes, but uh, <laughs> but I would say that you know one of the shortfalls of uh, unintended consequences of Goldwater Nichols was to, for example, remove the service chiefs from the acquisition process. So service chiefs were relegated to, um, the, the, to deciding what it is their services need, but once that, once that need was communicated, uh, they were forbidden really to, um, uh, to act in any way in the, uh, in the acquisition process. And, and um, what happens and still happens today is that if something serious happens in a service, um, you know, accident where troops are killed in training or something like that, we're using new te new equipment. Um, who is it that gets summoned to answer for that? Uh, for that, and that's the service chief. And um, so those were some of the things that uh, needed to be corrected. Um, I also think that um, you know we can make some improvements in uh, uh, in in the relationship between the service, the, the, the joint chiefs of staff, and the combatant commanders, uh, in the sense that um, combatant commanders can. In, in this day and age can go around the, uh, the, the Joint Chiefs and directly to the uh, Secretary of Defense because that's the chain of command. Uh, I believe that there is a good reason to think about putting the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs in the chain of command uh, because I think that would be uh, complementary to his overall duties because as we saw recently, when something goes wrong, the chairman gets uh, hauled in front of the uh, appropriate committees and has to answer for that. But he has technically, he's not in the chain of command. So to me, those are things that need to be discussed. I, I don't think I have the, you know, the whole blueprint, but um, acquisition, uh, command and control, uh, the role of the Joint Chiefs, which uh, in previous administrations have been, let's face it, emasculated and and, um, and bypassed in the Iraq war in 2003, pretty much. And I was one of those uh, service chiefs at the time. Um, so, th so there's a lot that can be done, I think, to improve our decision-making and our accountability processes. 
Listen, I want to be respectful of, respectful of everyone's time. Um, I think we're going to have to leave it here. I'm sure we could continue this discussion uh, for a long time. Um, I want to thank General Jones and General Pernaro. Um, his book is The Ever-Shrinking Fighting Force. And I'd also like to thank the Atlantic Council for having us today. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Missy. Terrific moderator.